say, Micah, the birth of Jesus, really? Yeah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2 through 5. That's an Old Testament of sticky pages. Chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. Yeah. So in verse 2, but thou Bethlehem Ephratah. And I had to look that up and hear the pronunciation. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of these shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old from everlasting. Therefore we will will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth had brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. And this man shall be the peace. When the Assyrian shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise up against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. Looking back at verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler of Israel, who is going forth have been from of old from everlasting. You can be seated tonight. I want to preach to you this thought tonight. Little town, small things, great purpose. Little town, small things, great purpose. You know, Christmas doesn't fall on Sunday very often. But guess what day Christmas is on next year? Sunday. Next year's leap year, in case you didn't know that. Uh, Christmas is on Sunday next year, but you know how can we do? How can we do our Christmas morning thing if we have to go to church? Well, why would we feel like it's an imposition to go to church on Christmas Day? How ironic to think of worshiping Jesus as an interruption to His birthday celebration. Here's a story about a mother who was running furiously from store to store on Christmas Eve. Trying to give those last minute gifts. Suddenly she realized she lost track of her three, her little three year old son. In a panic of course she retraced her steps and found him standing with his little nose pressed flatly against a frosty window. He was gazing at a manger scene. When he heard his mother call his name, he turned and shouted in innocent glee, Look, Mommy, it's Jesus, baby Jesus in the hay. Well, the hurried mom grabbed his arm and jerked him away, snapping, We don't have time for all that. Can't you see that Mommy's trying to get ready for Christmas? It's easy sometimes to, to find a little humor in what that, that, the, the, that mom's statement but I wonder how many of us feel the same way about Christmas this year. And maybe next year because it's falling on a Sunday. And when you think about it, what, what could be more appropriate than meeting together on the morning of Jesus' birth? To sing hymns or carols of praise with other believers. Today or tonight, I want to talk about one of the Christmas carols that we sing. And, uh, it was 1865 when a well-known American preacher named Philip, Phillips Brooks made a trip to the Holy Land. Years earlier, in his mid-twenties, Brooks had become pastor of the Holy Church in Philadelphia. He recruited a salesman named Louis Redner to serve as his church organist. The church grew from 30 to 1,000 in less than a year. Partly because of Brooks' preaching and partly because of Redner's music. Brooks gained a reputation as one of the most dynamic speakers of his day. In fact, 
Brooks was asked to preach the funeral sermon for President Abraham Lincoln. After preaching that sermon, Brooks felt so spiritually drained that, he, that his own church gave him a sabbatical, gave him a little leave, and Brooks made a trip to Jerusalem. On Christmas Eve, he rode on horseback from Jerusalem to Bethlehem where he listened to a choir singing in the Church of the Nativity. Brooks decided to write a poem to express how it felt to stand near the place where Jesus was born. He entitled the poem, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And later, Lewis Redner, his organist, wrote a melody that turned the poem into the popular Christmas carol we know today. Let me, there's a question that maybe you asked and maybe you haven't, but why Bethlehem? Ephratah. Why there? You know, as great a song as that is, Bethlehem really wasn't much to talk about uh, in the days of Jesus. Bethlehem itself was an obscure village that would not have impressed any of us. One source finds at the beginning of the first century, first century A.D., Bethlehem was a village with not more than 100 or 150 inhabitants. A small set of houses scattered along the side of a ridge and protected by a wall that was in very bad need of repair. So Bethlehem wasn't that much to look at. But it was the city God chose for the birthplace of Christ. It wasn't that much to look at. I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail here tonight, but you know, you may look at yourself and think you're not much. You may look at yourself and say you can't do it because of this or that. But if God has chosen you, amen, you can do it, amen. Here we find that Bethlehem was not much to look at, but it was the birthplace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But why? Why, when God could have chosen Jerusalem or Hebron or, or any number of, of the other impressive cities in that area, but He didn't. He chose Bethlehem. As it said in the prophecy of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And we notice here that the prophecy says Bethlehem Ephrathah. You know, I mean, seriously, do we see no little town of Bethlehem Ephrathah? No, we don't. Of course we don't. So why would Micah call it that? Well, because there were two Bethlehems in Israel. How many of you knew that? There's two Bethlehems in Israel. One is way up north, just a few miles from Nazareth, where Mary and Joseph lived. And the second one is about 75 miles south of Nazareth. And its proper name is Bethlehem Ephratah. 75 miles away from their home. God was being very specific as to which Bethlehem was to fulfill the prophecy. But what difference would it make, you may say? Why would God even care which Bethlehem Jesus was born in? Well, I want to point out three things today, or tonight. And the first thing this familiar Carol points out is that Bethlehem was a little town. And you see, God chose or chooses to use small things to accomplish His great purpose. Amen. The first thing we want to look at is God's greatest gift came to a little town. And the, and the song, excuse me, in verse 1 of O Little Town of Bethlehem, it says, O Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above that deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark old little town, street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. How many of you grew up in a small town? You know, less than, you know, several thousand people, five thousand people maybe. 
I, I grew up in a little place that was known then. I think it's now a town, actually. But it was called, I grew up just a little north of the village of Albany. And that's what it was called back then, was the village of Albany. Yeah, um, and that's the kind of town that Bethlehem was. Man. And at the time of Christ, it was a quiet little sheep herding community, uh, sheep herding community with only a population of about, about 150 or so. And, you know, for those of you that are not sure if you were from a small town, let me help you out. You know you're from a small town with the city limit signs are both on the same post. The local Motel 6 Sleep 6. And you'll notice it says that in Bethlehem there was no room in the inn. Uh, Bethlehem, of course, did not have a very big tourism attraction or draw. You know you're from a small town when you call the wrong number and they supply you with the correct number. You know you're from a small town when you don't use turn signals because everyone already knows where you're going. You know you're from a small town when the one block long Main Street dead ends in both directions. You know you're from a small town when a night on the town takes exactly 11 minutes. <laughs> you know you're from a small town if you have to name six surrounding towns just to explain where you're from. Well, if you were giving driving directions to Bethlehem, he would say it was about two miles outside of Jerusalem. Bethlehem may have been a sleepy little suburb, but it did have some notable history. Maybe some knew this and some don't, but Bethlehem is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 35, verses 16 through 19. Because Jacob's wife, Rachel, was buried there. She died giving birth to Jacob, to give birth to Jacob's young son. And before Rachel died, she named him Benoni, which meant the son of my pain or the son of my sorrow. But Jacob changed the boy's name to Benjamin, which means the son of my right hand. And isn't it interesting that both of these terms were used to describe the Messiah. You see, Bethlehem is also featured again in the book of Ruth. It was in Bethlehem that Ruth was redeemed, and that's where Ruth married Boaz. It was in Bethlehem that Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed, who would be the grandfather of King David, who was also born and raised in Bethlehem. Years later, Bethlehem, along with all of Judah, was conquered by the Assyrians. The last person in David's family line had been carried into captivity when the prophet Micah made this promise, or made this prophecy. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me the one who will be ruler over Israel. And 700 years later, this prophecy led the wise men to the birthplace of Jesus. You see, God still chooses small things today. Amen. The small things that you do may not look very appealing to people and may not look very good to others. But the small things that you do is God is going to bless you. Amen. And I believe that God will take the small thing that you're using for Him. I believe that God will take the small thing that you're reaching out for Him with. He can take that small thing and bless it and cause great things to come out of it. Number two, we find that God's greatest gift came through a humble, small family. Amen. Verse 2 of O little town of Bethlehem says, For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. You see, Mary and Joseph were not big shots in their community. 
Joseph was just a, a carpenter. And Mary, she was just a simple little peasant girl, if you would. They were far from the rich and the famous, but they are the ones that God chose to parent His one and only, His only begotten Son. Philip Brooks once said, it's while, it is while you're patiently toiling at the little task of life that the meaning and shape of the great whole of life dawns on you. For most of their lives, Mary and Joseph simply went about with their little small, their little mundane little jobs of everyday life and their daily living, living small lives in a small town. But in the process of living their small life in a small town, in the process, they protected and nurtured and raised up the hope of all the world. That's what they did. Here's a story. A story from World War II that shows how the smallest deed can make all the difference. During the last months of the war, the British conducted daily bombing raids over Berlin. One night, the bombers were attacked by a large group of German fighter planes. During the dogfight, one of the bombers, one of the bomber planes got separated from the protection of the British fighter planes. And they watched helplessly, helplessly as a German fighter plane came within range and, and bullets began to, to whiz over and over them and until suddenly they heard thud, 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 thud. Five times. Five small bullets slammed into the fuselage of their bomber near the gas tank. And of course the crew braced for the explosion. They was ready for it to blow up, but it never blew up. Fuel poured from these small little bullet holes, but there was no explosion. And after the landing, a mechanic handed the pilot the five small bullets that he had pulled from the plane. Curiously, of course, the pilot decided he wanted to open up the shells, and they were empty, except for a tiny wad of paper with a note that read, we are Polish POWs forced to make bullets for the Germans. But when the guards do not look, we do not fill it with powder. It's not much, but it's the best we can do. So five small, tiny bullets made by a few weak and lonely prisoners but the, for the crew of that British bomber, it was the small thing that made all the difference. Amen. Let me tell someone here tonight, no matter how little that you're doing in this church, if you're putting full effort in it, and you're giving everything you can to God, it's that small thing that's going to make the difference. Amen. It's the small thing that makes a difference. The third thing I want to look at is that God's greatest gift came as a helpless infant for a great purpose. His greatest gift came as a helpless infant for a great purpose. Verse number three of Old Little Town of Bethlehem says, How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, 
where meek souls will receive Him still, the dear Christ enters in. God often chooses insignificant people and events to bring about His great purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. You see, God loves to show His strength through human frailty, through our fragile beings that we are. And God can use you in a very big way. Amen. A lot of times the only thing that stops God from using you in a big way or using you, period, go look at yourself in the mirror. Amen. That's the only thing. Amen. Yes. He does not require us to be strong. He does not require us to be extremely intelligent. Thank God. <laughs> Amen. Or He doesn't require us to be amazingly talented. Amen. The one thing that God requires is obedience. Yes. Amen. You know, if Noah didn't, didn't obey God, what would have happened? Amen. I mean, it was his obedience. Amen. That saved the world then. That, that he was able to replenish. Amen. It was his obedience. And Joseph and Mary, just a carpenter, just a little peasant girl. There was nothing in society other than maybe to their close family. Nobody else knew them. They wasn't, you know, they, they wasn't well known. They couldn't walk into a local Walmart and run into 15, 20 people they knew. Like most of us do. Amen? But here they were. They were chosen. Because they were obedient to everything that God called them to be. It was obedience. Amen. Chuck Swindoll wrote, writes about a department store that decided to market a new item in their Christmas sales. Their idea was a dial, a dial in the form of baby Jesus. It was advertised as being unbreakable, washable, and cuddly. It was packaged in straw with a satin crib and a few appropriate scriptures to make it complete. It did not sell. And the manager of one of the stores panicked. In an effort to move the merchandise, he hung up a huge sign that read, Jesus Christ, marked down 50%. Let that sink in. That's why a lot of these churches are filled up tonight. Because they've marked everything down that's written in the Word of God. They don't give it the credit that it should be given. They take out the parts that don't to make people feel good. They take out the parts that, that tickles the ears, but does nothing with the heart. They mark Jesus down 50%. Get him while you can. Jesus Christ is not a marketing tool. Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven. Jesus Christ is our salvation. Jesus Christ is our mercy and He is our grace. You see, when God sent His Son as a helpless little infant, there was no big advertisement to tell how valuable that gift truly is. But today, we advertise this and we, we push this and, and I was in retail for a long time. We push these certain things and we, 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 we throw it out there and, and we make it sound so appealing. We make it sound so good. It's something that you got to have. And I think it's a shame and a disgrace that a church of a living God has to put itself out there as some kind of big marketing tool just to grow in a crowd when all they got to do is pick up the word of God and said, here it is. He came as a little bitty baby. He came in a small town. He's done some small things, but yet there's a great purpose. And I want you to know tonight that there is a great purpose for each and every one of you that are sitting here under my ground. Amen. The way that great purpose is to be accomplished in you is to be 
see, Jesus came to earth silently and humbly. He came to earth like every other human being. He came as a small, tiny infant. Jesus himself was entirely dependent on the loving care from his human parents. You see, God took on flesh not to show us how God would live on this planet, but to show us how a man can live in humble obedience to God. Look again at how Micah chapter 5 and verse 4 describes the Messiah. He will stand and shepherd his flocks in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be their peace. Through his obedience, this tiny little baby, this tiny infant, attained greatness that reaches to the ends of the earth. The power of Jesus is the power that brings peace to every heart that receives him. Small town. Small things or little town, small things, great purpose. Amen. Sister Melissa, would you come to the keyboard? Amen. As she comes, she's getting prepared to, to play and sing the song that I've been preaching about tonight. The first I want to read to you. This one last story. It was Christmas Day in the hills of South American Colombia. Two missionaries had been kidnapped by bandits and they were held captive in a little small hut. On that Christmas morning, one of the missionaries worked intently with pieces of hay that were on the hard clay floor. When he finished, he stepped back and he showed the other missionary the finished product. In the dim light of the hut, the other missionary smiled down at the single word spelled, spelled out there in the straw, Emmanuel. On that first Christmas morning, the day when Christ was born, there in the straw, lay the hope of all mankind. Emmanuel, God with us. I wonder if you would tonight, it's a little different, but if you would stand and make your way up to the front. If there's a hymn book set beside you, bring it. If not, there's some right here. Turn to page 393 if you don't know it. You can stand here facing them. We can make circles. However you want to stand up here. Everybody please. 